Welcome to this session entitled All You Wanted to Know About Collations. I developed this presentation because I found over the years that collations is one of these things that tend to confuse these conservative people. Maybe not so much because the collations themselves are confusing. No, the problem seems to be that SQL people and IT people in general are not always prepared for the surprises that human language can bring us. The fact that different languages do it differently. Also, code pages and character sets is also one of these things that people tend to have a foggy notion about, but which affects collation. So I developed this session to be, well, with the attention to well, teach you or learn you a few things, but also it's a kind of amusement. So you will see exactly that. Different languages do it differently. So you will also see a bit of language trivia. I also should remind you that this um, is a recording and while the recording is running, the plan is that I will be monitoring the chat and that can, I can answer the your questions there. And there will also be a Q&A session once the recording has completed. So who am I then? Well, my name is Alan Sonskuk. I live in Stockholm, Sweden, where I work as an independent consultant. I've been an MVP for SQL Server for very many years, and I maintain a website, someone's which you can see a small collection of large articles that goes in depth in a couple of topics. There is no article on collations there, at least not yet. Uh, there is also my email address, and that's the way to, if you want to get in touch with me, and I'm more, if you have any questions that come to you after this presentation, you're more than welcome to drop me a line at SQL, that's someone's going to SE. I also like to point out that already now you can get the slides and scripts for this presentation at someone's going to SE slash present. So here's my agenda. I will start to talk about collation basics and what is collations and when we define collations in SQL Server. I will then digress a little bit to give you a history of character sets and code pages, something we need to understand to understand, well, all the collations. And I will first talk about the Windows collations and talk about the autonomy of a collation name, all these paths, KS and all that might be what they mean. And that will eventually lead us to the UTF-8 collations. And finally, I will talk about the legacy SQL collations. And I should say that that autonomy thing, that will be a major part of this presentation. Uh, then I will discuss three collation pain points, where collations actually give us trouble in one way or another. Metadata, collation conflicts, and the uh, quite challenging task of changing the database collations. I will show you some tricks with collations, things for you where you might not even consider to use collations in the first place. And the last thing I will discuss is how collation may affect performance. So, what is a collation in the first place? Well, as, as it says on the slide, a collation is a set of rules for how to handle string data depending on the human language. This includes, well, first of all, comparison. Is this glyph here an uppercase I without dot equal to a lowercase I with dot? Is this one a single V equal to a W? Is this one O with a dot over or E, as I would pronounce it, greater than Z? Is plus greater than minus? Well, you may think that all of these, or some of these, they always have the same outcome. You might say to yourself, how could these two ever be equal? Well, be prepared. In this session, you will example, see examples of when all of these four are either true or false. Just beware. Once we have the rules for comparison, that gives the rules for grouping. Because if these two indeed are the same, well, then they will do group, to, group together in the group by. Likewise, sorting, if this one, if this one is greater than, than z, well, then o with dots, o, well, o with dots over, will sort after z in an order by clause, else it will sort before z. Upper and lower, these functions also depend on the collation, because yes, different languages do it differently. The like ranges, some people I tend to think, that oh, these are ASCII ranges. No, no, they depend on the collation, and you will see an example of this towards the end. And there are actually two more things that the, uh, are, depends on the collation, but they are not really related to language directly. So I will return to the, them and introduce them as we move on. Now, let's look where we define the collation in SQL Server. We can do that on four different levels. First of all, there is the server collation, which we set when we install SQL Server. The server collation, well, that sets the collation for the system databases. And it serves as the default collation for string columns in temp tables. It, the server collations also serves as a, the default for the database collation. But when you create the database, in, database, you can say, no, no, I don't want the server collation. I want that one. Yeah, yeah the third one from the top of that, that, on that shelf. Yes, please. 
And the database collation then defines the collation for string variables and literals when we are in that database. The database collation also sets the default collation for columns, string columns in user tables and table variables in difference to temp tables. Now, when you create a table, be that a temp table, a permanent table, you can say, no, no, I don't want that collation. I, I, I want that collation. I, I don't want the database collation. I want that collation, yeah, on, that one out, out on the edge, in the, right quite in the middle, that shelf, please, yes. And finally, you can cast the collation on the fly in an expression. In this session, you will see plentiful example of these three. You will not see this one because you don't want, want, want to watch me installing SQL Server. However, I'd like to point out one thing about when you run the setup wizard and you write to this page called Server Configuration. Now here, the collation choice is tucked away on a secondary tab, so the default will not be splashed into your all right, but always, always, please go and look at that page. Always go to this because it, the default may not be what you expect. The default is taken from your Windows system locale, not your personal regional settings. And even if you trust that you have the Windows system locale, the default collation is far from always the best choice or even relevant for your system locale. So just to take two examples, let's say you're in Poland. Yes, you will get a Polish collation. That's good. Uh, if you're in Norway, uh, well, no, you don't get Norwegian collection. You get something else. Not good for Norwegian. Anyway, I can't go through all the examples. Here is a link to the documentation. And you have to go to that page and scroll down to server level collation to see the default for each system locale. And please remember this. Once you have installed the server, created databases, populate, created tables, added data to them, changing the collation is going to be painful, and we're going to come back to that later in this session. Um, if you want to know what is the collation of various levels, well, for the server collation, you can use this function server property with the argument collation. For the database collation, you can use database property x with the database name and collation, or for both, you can look at sys databases. The system databases will tell you what is the server collection. And for the column collation, well, either sphelp or look at sys.coms. Now, I need to digress a little bit to give you a brief history of character set and code pages. So in the beginning, that was ASCII. It was, or is, a 7-bit character set that encodes 95 characters with codes from 32 to 126. The remaining were used to be uh, control characters. Now you may ask, 7-bit, why not 8? Well, way back in the 60s, there were all sorts of uh, architectures and computers, and this was based, I think, I read on Wikipedia on a 7-bit teleprinter. Um, capital A, just to make some example of these codes, capital A is 65 or 41 hex, you've probably seen these, uh, lowercase a is 97, or 61 hex, etc. You probably know some of these, you can recognize these when you see them, I have to read ASCII, I have to read uh, hex dumps, and so things like that. Um, ASCII was designed with English in mind, well, not surprising given the fact that A stands for American. There were also natural variations. So, for example, for Swedish, well, they took out the brackets and the braces, or we did, we took out the brackets and the braces, and added out the letters we have that are not in English. But these seven bit variations of ASCII, they are dead now. Or at least they should be. I actually occasionally do see examples of them, but they are rare. Now, Eventually, vendors started to think, wait a minute, we have 8 bits. We are, because by then, at the beginning of the 1980s, everything was bytes, 8 bit bytes. So, why not use all 8 bits for characters? Because, you know, with, with 7 bit, it was kind of difficult if you wanted to mix Swedish and French, for example, in the same document. So, at least with 8 bit characters, we can at least have a couple of languages covered by one single character set. So, they designed a work on that. And they all use ASCII for the range from 32 to 126 to be uh, compatible. And then they added more range uh, in the range from 128 to 255. And sometimes they started 160 to add more control characters. Um, problem here was that every vendor did, on, did this on the road, so they were proprietary and incompatible. But eventually, there was a standard that emerged, ASO 8859. And it was a series of sets. So the first 8859 is Latin 1 Western, for Western Europe, 8859.2 was Eastern Europe, and a couple of more Latin. 3, 4, or 5, etc. There are also sets for Arabic, Cyrillic, Greek, and Hebrew. Um, so, what did Microsoft do in these states? Well, you know, in the 80s, they worked with MS-DOS for IBM. And MS-DOS had, well, had their own proprietary character sets. And Microsoft used 
use the term code pages, which they got from IBM. So CP437, that was the original one. It had a few more letters, not in ASCII, but also a bunch of line drawing characters. So it was not really good for, for Europe. But eventually they repaired that, so code page 850 is good for Western Europe, 852 for Eastern Europe, and there were a couple more of them. Then Microsoft moved on and, and designed Windows, and for Windows they, they decided to be standardized and went with ISO 859. But they still call them code pages, it's known as an ANSI code page in Windows. And here are some examples, a 1250, that's the one for Eastern Europe, 1251 is the Cyrillic one, and 1252 is Latin one for Western Europe. Um, and, but they couldn't really resist to, to because there was a gap. One, uh, uh, 8859 does not, Latin 1 does not have characters in the, in the range from 128 to 159, but they fill in some extras with some consequences for SQL Server, as we're going to see later on. Now, although this was kind of good, we could have Swedish and French now in the same document, we couldn't have Swedish and Polish because they use different character sets. So again, the vendors start to think about this. We should do better. Thankfully, at this time, they did not do it each one on their own, but they formed the Unicode Consortium, and eventually they defined Unicode, a single character set that encodes all languages. It, Unicode has, the way it is defined, there's 1.1 million possible code points in 21 bits, and today 143,000 are currently defined. Um, and new versions of Unicode come out every, every once in a while with more and more code points. Now, one thing you should know is that all living languages can be expressed within the so-called base plane, the code points from 0 to 65535, 60 bits. So if you have been thinking of Unicode as a 60-bit character set, well, that is some reason for that, because most of the time you will use characters from this base plane. Um, and you should also, also know this, that the code points from 32 to 126, yes, that is ASCII, and the code points from 160 to 255, that is Latin 1. Here is a sample code points, and Unicode, the way code points are uh, denoted, is always U plus and the code in hex. So capital A, O plus, plus, oh, sorry, U plus 0041, just like in ASCII. Here is U plus 0141, but that's a Polish character, L with a slash over, which you will see a couple of more times in this session. Here is the Greek letter alpha, here is a J Japanese character, and here is a playing card. The, the playing card here is beyond the base plate, so that's why you have five hex digits. We only use four hex digits for characters in the base plane. Now, this is only the code points. In a computer, they also have to be encoded in some way, and that can be done in more than one way. So a very simple way is UTF-32, completely fixed, four bytes per code points, but very rarely used in practice. There is also UTF-16, which uses two bytes per code points for the base plane, and then four bytes per code point for the rest. And exactly how that works, we're going to see later. And there's also UTF-8, very popular in some circles, which uses one to four bytes per code point. And we're also going to look at that in a little more in detail later on. Now, and as I said, UTF-8 is very popular. I think most Unixes uses UTF-8. However, Windows is based on UTF-16. And as far as Windows is concerned, UTF-8 is just now on the code page 65001. Um, so, Let's now bring this to SQL Server and the string data types in SQL Server. There are two of them, or well, there's more than, or two pairs of them, so to speak. So we have Envacar and Encar, and these are Unicode, and they are stored as UTF-16. Important, just as a reminder, if you have a string literal and you want it to be Envacar, you have to proceed it with N. Some people might find this a little funny. If you work with C++, it's perfectly normal because you do the same thing there, except that the letter is L. And then we have Varkar and Kar. So this, these, you, as a string literals, so there is no M, then they are Varkar and Kar. And they always have a, well, a limited character set because the collation is tied to a code page. Each code coll collation is, that's part of the collation definition, is a code page. And the code page defines which characters that are available. So if we try to put a character into a Varkar, which is not in that restricted set of characters, well, then we will get a fallback, and you will see an example of this just in a few seconds. One more thing you might like to know, not all collations support Varkar and Kar, and you will also see examples of that in this demo. So, <clears throat> first of all, let's have a look at my server, so you want to see what, what is the collation of my server and what is the code page of that one. With the, I use the function collation property, which I give the collation name, 
I do need to convert because this one returns the SQL variant. And then you give the code bridge. So let's see what I have. Well, my collation is finished Swedish 100 CS, CSES. And, well, not very strange. I'm Swedish, so I have a Swedish collation. And the code bridge is 1252 Latin 1. So let's now look at these three strings here. You see, you get the C's. There's the same three strings. These are preceded by n, these literals, so they are n vakar, these are not. This one reads Rijksmörgels. It's a Swedish word meaning shrimp sandwich. It's a fun word because it includes all the three extra letters in the Swedish alphabet that are not in ASCII and English. Uh, this is a Polish word, it reads Swanse. It means sun. It includes two letters in the Polish alphabet not present in English. There are more than there are a few, quite a few more extra letters in Polish. The last one is a name, it reads Nakameguchu. It's a district in Tokyo. Now, I'm going to run these two selects, and on top you see Rijksmogos, Swanse, and Nakameguchu. Here you also see Rijksmogos, it's Varkar, but because the code pitch is Latin 1, which is good for Swedish, I get all the characters. But here I don't get Swanse, I get Slonse, because you might notice here that there is, oops, I, sorry about that, that. There is a slash on the L, there's an accent over the N, but they, these, those letters are not available in this code page, so they're being replaced by lookalikes. So that's why we, why we get Sonsa. Now, these characters, there are no lookalikes for Japanese characters in this code page, so they are be, being replaced by the generic fallback character, which is the question mark. So, then I'm going to create a database called Japanese CIAS, which is going to use that collation. Yes, when I create the database, I can just say, collate, give me this collation, please. And all the databases I will create today will have the name of the collation and then use that collation. So I'm going to move to that one and again look at the code page for this collation. And it's 932, so this is a Japanese code page. Now I'm going to run these two selects again. And again, the opera reads, Raksmos, Swanson, Nakanguru. But this one now reads differently. This one reads Rock Smogas, because these three letters are not available in this code page, so they are being replaced by lookalikes. Now, why it's for some reason here, they're not being replaced by lookalikes, but they are being replaced by the generic fallback character. Why? I don't know. But most, most important, look here, Nakameguru. Nakameguru comes back, the Japanese characters. Now, give this a little thought. You know, these are ideographic characters, and there are thousands of them. And this is a, you think this might be an 8-bit character set, so we only have the code points from 128 to 255. How do they do that? How can they squeeze in all those, those characters? Well, we're going to find that out in a second. I'm going to create a table here called words, and I'm going to add two words, Nakamiguru and Yokohama. But Yokohama is written in Latin script. And then I'm going to look at the word itself. I'm going to look at the length. The length function returns the number of characters in the word excluding trailing spaces, whereas a data length returns the number of bytes. So let's have a look at this. Yokohama, it's eight characters and eight bytes. Nakamaguru, three characters and six bytes. So that is how they do it. They take two bytes and put them together to form this character. So in this code page, a character can be one or two bytes. It's a variable length. And particularly, varkar is not necessarily 8-bit. Now, I'm going to try to add one more word to this table. This is a railway station in Tokyo. One, two, three, four, five characters. So, and it's varkar 8, so you might... Do you think it's going to fit or not? Oh, I got an error message. String of binary data will be truncated in Japanese CIDB words. Call a word truncated value, and it's only the first four characters. You see, varkar 8 means 8 bytes, not 8 characters. Which you may or may not like, but, well, the Japanese people have had to put up with this since SQ2000 was released, and that was first, the first time there was support for Japanese at all in SQ Server. Now, we're going to move, change the theme a little bit. So I'm going to create this table called India. It's going to have an end varkar column, and I, no, I, here, explicitly say, I want this collation. So this is how I do that, specify the column collation. And I want the collation Indic General 100 CIAS. Seems appropriate for an Indian table. So this runs very good. Now I'm going to create a second table, but this time with a Valkar column. But this time I'm told collation Indic General 100 CIAS is supported on Unicode data types only and can be applied to 
It cannot be applied to Karl and Barker and text data types. So this is an example of those collations that do not support Barker. I will come back with a list of those longer, sorry, later on when I discuss collation families. And then we might think, okay, but I'm only going to use nvarcar, and I know that any, no one on the system tables uses varcar, so I'm going to try to create a database with this collation. No, I can't do that, because it's not, it's not support varcar. So this is a little, I mean, India is not a particularly small country, so I don't know how they've been doing this, but yes, that's the way it is. And why? Well, so what is the code page for this collation? Well, zero, there is no code page for, well, I guess, historical reasons. So, yes, reminder, barcode is not necessarily 8 bits. Now let's talk about all the collations. In this 2019, there is a frightening number of 5,508 collations. And actually, there is about 180 more that are deprecated that you don't have to use extra tricks to see. Um, they fall into two main groups. There are 77 so-called SQL collations, which are legacy, which I will return to later on. The only thing I'm going to say right now is that you can recognize them by the fact that the name starts with SQL underscore. Then I will mainly, mainly focus on the other group, the 5,431 5, Windows collations. They are based on, well, the documentation says, Windows system locales. I don't know exactly what that means, but I guess that this server team simply uh, founded their work on the heavy lifting that the Windows team had done so for their internet, internet, internationalization of Windows. Important thing to know about the Windows collation is that in the Windows collations, all operations are carried out in UTIF-16, also for Varkar. So if you do something like Karen Nix, well, they may be not substring, but most other ones, they will do that, convert to UTIF-16 and then use that library. Now, Let's look at the collation names. They, they, well, here's one example. Polish 100 CI, AI, KS, WS, SC, UTF-8. So what is the autonomy of that? What does all this mean? Well, here is the quick summary. Polish, that is the collation family. 100, that is the version number. CI and AI, that is about case and accent sensitivity or insensitivity. KS, WS, VSS, all relate to Japanese or East, East Asian. SC stands for supplementary characters. And not seen here, but there's also been and been too for binary collations. And finally, there is UTF-8 for UTF-8 support. And now for quite a few slides, I will dissect this in more details. So let's start with the collation families. And here we have some examples, yes. So some collation families offer a specific language, like well, Polish, SMEs, for example. Some languages have more than one collation family. So for example, Spanish, there is both traditional Spanish and modern Spanish. Why there is, you will actually learn that in the demo that is upcoming. Then some languages can share a collation because they have the same rules, like Finnish and Swedish. And then there's Latin one general, which, well, it's a group of languages that uses the Latin script that have actually the same rules and they can share a collation. And that's actually quite a, some quite major languages like English, Indonesian, Portuguese, Italian, German, to name a few. And then we have Indic general, which covers, well, quite a few languages in India, but as you can see, not all. SMEs is also an Indian language, but it covers quite a few. There's also Cyrillic general that covers, well, some of the major languages using the Cyrillic, but not script, but not all. There's only those that have the same rules. Because the collation family, what does it determine? Well, first of all, the basic sorting and comparison rules, because they follow, comes, well, follow from the alphabet, basically. And then they are further refined where the, from where the collation is C, a case insensitive case or in case uh, insensitive or case sensitive, same thing for accent sensitivity. The version of it can also have some effect. We're going to see one example of this bit on. Um, and also, it also determines the rules for lower and upper, because again, that follows from the language, and different languages do it differently. And finally, the collation family also determines the code page for VARCAR, with the exceptions of the UTF-8 collations. But all uh, code pages that starts with the same, we start with that first part, had the same code page. Now, let's look at the demo here. And this demo is more intended to, well, for fun to show you that different languages do it differently. The first thing we're going to look at, though, is this function, sys.f and underscore help collations. It's a function, but it doesn't take any arguments. And it simply returns all collations that are on SQL Server. Starts with a number of Albanian collations, followed by a number of Arabic, and I can scroll it down. You see some Hungarian collations, and some Khmer, etc., etc., etc. And down here, you can see it returns Oops, no, you can't because I scrolled out of sight. Sorry about that. 
Let's try it again. 5,508 rows. So I'm going to create a database called Lat1 General CIAS and move to that database. And I'm going to create this table called Silkworms, which has three columns, a number, a word, and a remark. And I'm going to fill this one up. And so the numbers will give you the sorting as it is in English. The word is the one we're going to work with. And the remark, if you wonder what a word means, you can read the remark column. I'm not going to talk about it as such. So first of all, I'm going to run this with the current collation of the current database. So that will be the rules of English or Portuguese, etc. And you can see here, I can't get back 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Now let's try this in Spanish. And this is an example of an expression collation. So I have word and I add collate, collate traditional Spanish CIAS. So I'm casting the collation of word, saying, hey, please sort this according to this collation. And now I get 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 4, 8, 7, 9, 10, 11, 12. So what happened here? Well, first of all, Chicos moved to be between Chen Center and Chardas to come between Cycle and Netherlands. This is because in the Spanish language up to 1994, CH was considered a separate letter and sorted between C and D in the dictionary. Then in 1994, the Royal Spanish Academy said, oh, wait a minute, this is too complicated for the computer age. Let's change this. So they demoted CH to just be, well, anything that starts with C. So these days, in a Spanish dictionary, you find CH between um, CJ and CK. So that's why you have traditional Spanish and modern Spanish. Um, we also have the end with the tilde over, ni, which is rarely the beginning of a word, but I happen to know one word that starts with this letter. And this is considered a separate letter in Spanish still today. They haven't changed that. And because it's a separate letter, and it, in, the, in the dictionary, it's between N and O. So that's why we change that order. Now, let's try this with Hungarian, Hungarian collation, and see what happens. Now we're 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 5, 7, 8, 10, and 9. So Chikos is back, but now Chardas comes after the cycle. Because in Hungarian, CS is a separate letter, actually with the same pronunciation as CH in Spanish. And, they, and the Hungarian, though, they haven't changed that. They're still doing that. And also, a widotso, or U, that's a separate letter in Hungarian, which sorts between O and P in their alphabet. So then welcome, welcome to my language, Finnish Swedish collection. See, let's, let's see how we do it. One, three, four, five, six, seven, ten, two, and nine at the end. So as I told you before, Swedish has three extra letters, not in English, and you see two of them here. But in difference to Spanish and Hungarian, we have not put them in the alphabet after the language, or sorry, after the letter they kind of derived from. No, we have put them at the end of our alphabet. So this is our third to last letter in our alphabet, and this is the last one. Now, let's move over to my Danish neighbors and see how they do it. And you will get more surprises. Three, four, and nine, two, one at the end. Also, Danish has three extra letters not in English. They are also at the end of their alphabet. But first of all, this one, they actually don't have this letter, O with dots over. They have O with slash over. But the pronunciation is the same, so this one, O with dots over, co-sorts with O slash. We do the same thing in Swedish. But this one, they do have this one, A with ring over. But it's their last letter on their alphabet, not like in Swedish. Why? Well, you see, we Swedes, we kind of live it. Progressive? Can I say that? We added this letter in the, I think, 15th century. Danish, they were lagging it behind a little bit, so they didn't come around to it until 1948. Before that, in all the languages, we used the double A, but in Sweden, we, we had done away with all, all that. But in Denmark, they still spelled quite a few names with this sound, still with the double A, for example, this city. So for this reason, in a Danish collection, AA co sorts with an A with a ring over. That's why. So generally, other words with A would, will be on top, but always, yes, it will be on the, at the end. So this is an example of how different languages do it differently. Now, so here are some collation families that done, here are the collation families that do not support Varka. So there are quite a few in India, Assamese, Bengal, and Indic general, and this one, well, it's in the Maldives. And we have Nepali also in that neighborhood. A few more also in Asia, Khmer, Lao, and Tibetan. 
and also Syriac is in Iraq, uh, Turkey, and this one is in Afghanistan. This is Maltese is the only European one, and this is on New Zealand. But this does not apply to the UTFA collations. But if you use any of these collations, well, you can only use them with NVACA. Now, let's talk about the version number. The version number can be well, other, none at all, and we can read that as 80. And then we have 90, 100, and 140. So 80, that was the original Windows collations that were introduced in SQL 2000, the first version of SQL Server to have collations, what we had before, we're going to talk about that later. In SQL 2005, they added a couple of more collations to support a few more languages. And in SQL 2008, they added even support for even more languages and also new versions of the original collations. Then they didn't really add any new versions until SQL 2017, but these are the 140 collections are only for Japanese. Now, the version of it has some, has some importance, and this is a little bit difficult to explain. First of all, there is a mapping kind of relation to Unicode, but uh, so version 80, I think, relates kind of to Unicode 2.1 and this one to Unicode 5.0, but not strictly. And but but what does that really matter? What you ask? Okay, so I'm going to tell you. This determines which code points are defined. And that's probably does still not ring a bell. So let's move to the demo to explain this. So I'm going to move to my database, Latin one in general, CIAS, and this is a version 80 collation. And here I'm going to have this variable, that's sun, which I'm going to assign the Polish word swansa, meaning sun. But if you have been paying attention, or if you know Polish, you can tell that there is a misspelling. That accent on the end should be an acute accent, not a grave accent. So let's say so I'm going to try to do an uppercase in that word. I'm going to try to replace that wrong character with the right one. I'm also going to try to find it with, with car index. And finally, I'm going to compare its son to Swatze without any N at all of any sort. And the results are, well, surprising. The N is not uppercase. The replace did not replace it. It's still the grave accent. Car index did not find it. And the equal qualities, yes, yes, they're equal. They are the same. This is because in a version 80 collation, this code point is not defined in this version of Unica. You don't see this here in Management Studio because Management Studio is using a font which is based on a lot later version of Unica. This character, by the way, which is used in Pinyin, a way of writing Chinese with uh, Latin letters. So therefore, well, it's not, I think, very strange that upper doesn't work, but <laughs> You might think that, okay, the character is undefined, but why not simply just look at the byte value? Well, that's the only way it works. The way it works is that, oh, I don't know what this character means. I don't know what to do about it. Well, I do nothing for replacing car index. And same thing for the comparison. Here you could say it makes a little more sense because it doesn't really mean anything. But these two are just a little bit irritating. Now, anyway, <clears throat> I'm going to create a database here called Latin General 100 CIAS with that collation. And I'm going to rerun the same thing. And now it's all up the case. The accent is now acute as we wanted. Karen Nick signed it, and no, it's not equal to Swatzer. So in this collation, this version of Unicode, or this very all collations with version number 100, this code point is defined, is understood as an N with a grave accent. Now, let's have a look at another example, another angle of this, where this might have importance. Not the least, I would expect that quite a Quite a few listeners to this presentation might be based in India. So here's a table called Lang name, and I've got the two columns, an English name and the native name. And for this column, I will use the collation Hindi CIAS. This is one of these deprecated collations. And why it is deprecated? Well, you will understand very soon. So in this table, I'm going to add a token uh, European language, and then I'm going to add a couple of language, language from India, Telugu, Hindi, Marathi, Bengali, and Kannada and then also add them in the native name, written in their own language with their own script. I got these names, names from Wikipedia. I, sorry, I don't know these languages myself. So I'm not trying, but I thought this was interesting. And now I'm going to run this query, which is kind of weird in a way. I take this table line names, I'm going to cross join to this, which gives the number one to six. And basically what I'm going to do, is I'm going to run a loop and extract one character at the time from native name, with substring, and then try to find that character with car index and say, okay, return me this row if, if this one gets back zero. Okay, so if the character in the name is not found in the name, yeah, but 
Yes. Um, still, that is what we're going to do. And also, it's also a filter on the length, so we're going to try, of course, one reason this could have worked out is that if I try to use the sixth character, the name is only five characters. So that's also a filter by that. Anyway, so this query should not return in rows, but I get one for Tulu, one for Canada, and two for Hindi. So, in the version 8 collation, two of the characters needed to write the name of the Hindi language in Hindi itself are undefined codepoints. Now you may guess why this is a deprecated collation. It is no good. Now, I'm going to change the collation of this column to be Kazakh 90 CIS. Kazakh? What has that to do with India? Nothing. Nothing at all. But it is the version number that matters. So that's why I put in Kazakh only to demonstrate that. So now, I'm going to change that. And now the query returns no rows. So if you're going to work with languages from India, you need at least a version 90 collation. And I would recommend a version 100 collation. Um, as I looked at the history of Unicode, it seems like they've been adding letters for these scripts even in later versions of Unicode than 5.0, but they might be very rare characters. As I said, I don't know about these languages myself, except that I've seen forum questions where people have had problems with, I think it was Tlugu. Now, just to repeat this, so when a component is undefined, well, then weird things may happen. Car and Nix alike may not find the character, replace may not replace the character, the character might be ignored in comparisons, and up below, well, they will have no effect. I'm saying may here because some tests I've made actually undefined code points seem, I seem to be working for me. Um, so, yes, depending on the language you work with, you may need a version 100 collations, and we did in the demo see two examples, Pinyin, if you work with Chinese, and most of the languages in India. Um, I found this uh, history page with versions of Unicode that might give you some idea if you need to consider a version 100 collation. But oh, when in doubt, go for a version 100 collation to at least reduce the risk. Now, let's talk about case and access insensitivity. So, CI, that stands for, well, case insensitive, and in that case, lowercase, um, lowercase, insert, sorry, insert in all lowercase is equal to insert in all uppercase. And CS, well, then insert in all uppercase is different. Nothing strange there. And then we have accent insensitivity. So, we have two words, English words here, resume and resume. And if there's accent insensitive, accent insensitive, they are considered to be equal, which is quite good because, you know, a lot of people have English as the native language. They can't really spell it, so they leave out the, the accents and spell it. Press you may assume as well. But if it's accent sensitive, well, then they are different. So this is again where, well, different languages do it definitely. You're going to see some examples of that. But also, also look at how case sensitive collations are being sorted. Now, I'm going to move to my database, Latin one general, 100 CIS. And yes, they are equal, as you might expect in the case insensitive database. Then I'm going to create a case sensitive database. I'm going to run the same thing. And they are different. Now, I'm going to create a Turkish case insensitive database and run the same thing. And so, what do you expect here? Are you ready to place your bets? Different! Different! So, what is going on here? Well, let's do an upper and lower on this. And look, there is a dot over the eye. And there is no dot over the eye there. You see, Turkish has two I letters, so to speak, the dotted I and the dotless I. And the dotted I is dotted in both uppercase and lowercase, and the dotless I is dotless in both uppercase and lowercase. They uh, represent two different vowel sounds in Turkish. And, well, this was designed way back in the 1920s before computing and ASCII made, this, made the scene, so don't blame them for that. And from a phonological perspective, there is some interesting symmetry in, in that design. Now, just to demonstrate how this works, so let's see here. Here we have the, the uppercase i with a dot and lowercase i dot. This is actually how you write Istanbul in Turkish. It's a dotted i. And here we have the word kizil, which means red in Turkish. Here are all lowercase and here upper, in all uppercase. And they're equal because it's case insensitive. Now I move back to my Latin one general database. Now here they are different letters, at least, well, whatever should we put this, but let's say we're English or Swedish. Well, this is some variation of an i. There is a dot, but it doesn't mean anything. But it's an accent, and it's accent sensitive, so not equal. Now let's move to an accent insensitive database. I'm going to create a database called Latin one General 100 CIAI. And again, they're equal because now it's only a matter of accents, and we have, yes, they're equal. 
Now, accent insensitivity is something that also can give you some surprises. <clears throat> so we're going to create this table called accent insensitive. There's a left word and there's a right word. And the, there is a column, column called English where I compare them, saying are they equal or not equal. They're called on Polish, where I cast them to a Polish CI, AI, and the same thing. And also a Swedish column where I cast to a case in, sorry, accent and case insensitive uh, Finnish Swedish collation. So I'm going to create that up, I'm going to create that table. And I'm going to add some words and have a look at them. Oops. And the first word out is, the first pair is resume and resume. And they are equal in all three. At least English and Swedish uses this character. But in Swedish, for example, the e accent on the E is only there to signify stress. It's not the character of its own. So it's just an accent, and therefore they're equal. Then we have the next two pairs. This is Swanse and Slanse. Well, that's a word. This is not a word, as far as I know. Anyway, English and Swedish people think that this slash or this accent, well, well flea craps doesn't mean nothing. Just so, I mean, what's the difference between this and Slanse? Of course. So English and Swedish people think they're equal. Now, Polish people who are better educated think, oh, wait a minute, these are letters different letters. So yes, they are not equal. Then we have the English word cooperate, written in two different ways. Most people spell it this way, but occasionally you see this spelling where people have added a dot over the second O to mark the fact that it's cooperate and not cooperate. So that is just sort of pronunciation helper, just like an accent to mark the stress. So rightly, English and Polish thinks they are equal. But Swedish, oh, oops, here's an accident. This actually coincides with the last letter of, of of our alphabet, so we think they are not equal. Then we have two English words again, wine and vine. And English thinks, of course, they are not equal. <laughs> they are different words. Polish doesn't use the letter V, but yes, it's not equal. But Swedish, yes, they are equal. Because you see, in Swedish, this is not really a W. It's a double V. It's just a fancy way of writing the V. Sort of, yeah, okay, you seem to be more important, so you spell your name with double V instead of V. You know, these English people, they get all saying, W, W, W. In Swedish, we just say, V, V, V. A lot quicker, a lot quicker. So, yes. And then we have this one. This is also kind of fun. So, yes, again, not equal, not surprising, but equal in Swedish. Because this letter used in, for example, German. In Swedish, we know this one is German Y, and that's why it consorts and considered an accent of a Y. Now, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about how to sort case-sensitive data, because that is something that people sometimes have the wrong idea about. So that's why I want to show you this. I've got a table called case sorting. There's a number, there's a word and varka, and a data column, which, which is just a number. That will be a second sort condition when the word is, okay, we want to sort case-sensitive. So we're going to add these words. And first, we're going to sort this by a Latin general CIS and the data column. And you can see here, the mixed case comes in kind of random order. Well, not if we look at the data column, 6, 13, 37, 58. We can also see that minus sorts before plus. But mixed plus case comes here, but mixed minus case comes here. Why? Well, we will understand that in a second. Also note here, Andrew asserted Australia. Perfectly to expect in a case insensitive collation. Now, let's instead do this with a case sensitive collation and see what changes. So, minus plus, and you assert in Australia. That order did not change, although that lowercase a is now considered different from a. But the case only matters when nothing else differs. It carries secondary weight. But here we have all these mixed cases. Now we can see there is a kind of order. We have first the all lowercase, then the one with initial uppercase, the one with capital M and capital C, and then we have this one with all uppercase. And mixed hyphen case comes here because the hyphen again also carries a secondary weight. And this is actually quite nice because this is how we want it when we look in a dictionary. I mean, we, words are sometimes spelled with, with the hyphen, but we don't want to know that. So we just gonna, we don't want to have to know that when we look up the word. But plus doesn't mean anything, that that still sells, sells as a punctuation character. And let's also look, take a quick look at accent sorting, the same kind of table. Just a few rows. Um, so the first going to look at this is a case-sensitive, accident-sensitive collation. Yes, you can have that combination if you feel like. And now we have, well, we do resume, resume, return. But resume, resume comes before resume because 12 is less than 56. 
Remember, this is accent insensitive. Now let's do this accent sensitive and see how that works. And resume and resume changes places because there is an accent, so that comes after resume. However, resume still comes before return because the accent only matters when nothing else differs. Again, secondary weight. Um, so, watch out for Turkish and accent insensitive comes with surprises. And then sorting and case insensitivity, just quick return, when sorting is in a case insensitive collation, case only has a secondary weight, and lowercase source before uppercase in a Windows collation. And yeah, so a hyphen also have a secondary weight, it's not true for other punctu punctuation, and the same thing is true also for accents in an accent sensitive collation. Now let's talk about Japanese matters. These are KS, WS, and also VSS that can appear in the collation name. So KS, KS stands for Kana Sensitive. A Japanese has two civil scripts, hiragana and katakana, and the way it works, I'm told, is that hiragana is mainly used for native words, whereas katakana is used for foreign words. So anyway, here we have nakamiguru again, to the left in hiragana, and to the right in katakana. Now is the question, are they equal to each other? Yes, as long as it does not say KS in the collation name, they are equal. But if it's KS, it's kana sensitive, and they are different. Then we have WS. You may notice here that these characters are a bit wide compared to the Latin letters. So, in order to match things up, what they've done in, in Japan, also I think in China, is that they've added full width versions, as they call it, of the ASCII characters. So here we have Paris, in half width, and full width. And they also have half width forms of the katakana to match up when you put in the katakana thing in the Latin text. Now is the question, are these two pairs equal to each other? Half, half width, full width? Well, as long as it does not say WS and the collation name, they are equal. But if it does say WS, it's width sensitive and they are different. Finally, we have VSS, which stands for Variation Selector Sensitive. I will afraid I have to pass on this one. I was, have not been able to find a good example. Um, it, the only collations to be VS Variation Selector Sensitive are the Japanese collation with version number 140. That is not to say that it only applies to Japanese, but Apparently, it was more important for Japanese than anything else. Let's now talk about binary collations. They uh, sort and compare by the code point. They are case, accent, kana, and everything else sensitive. Not particularly user-friendly, but they are faster than the other collations. But to confuse matters, they are both bin and bin too. Uh, what's the difference between these two? <laughs> well, I'm not going to try to explain that in text. I need a demo. So, I'm going to move to my database. Latin one general CIAS, and I'm going to create a table called binary test, and then I'm going to add two strings to that table, DE, DN with accent, and L slash with N accent. You might uh, re recognize these Polish characters. Let's then look at the code point for these, uh, for the code points, both in decimal and in hex. So the Unicode function returns, it's the same thing as well, the Unicode value instead of the ASCII value. So 68693213233. So the binary and so code point order, they sort in this order. And here they are in hex, 0044, 0045, 0141, and 0143. So let's first simply cast them to binary and sort by the binary representation. I mean, if they're going to sort by code point, they should sort in that order. But they don't. The L slash comes before the D, and the N accent comes before the E. But, we'll look, but when we look at the binary, that's quite clear, because 41 certainly comes before 44, and 43 before 45. But why are the bytes swapped? This has nothing to do with collations. This has to do with how computers are built. There are big engine architectures, and in the big engine architecture, the bytes come in the order you would expect them. In the little engine architecture, the bytes are always being reversed in the value, so they are swapped here. And the Wintel is a little engine architecture, so that's why we have this. But if then you, sorry, that was the wrong thing, place to click. Um, so. If I now instead sort by a Latin, Latin general bin 2 collation, so the bin 2 collation, and I get them in the right order, DE, DN accent, L slash N accent, the order we might expect them because the bytes are now being swapped before the sorting is applied. Now, what is now a bin collation, you may ask? Well, let's have a look at that. And, well, D comes before the N slash, but the N accent comes before the E. So, in a bin collection, they only swap the, first, the bytes of the first character, and the rest they sort by the raw binary. 
And what's the point with that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it seemed like a good idea at the time, but I guess they just think it's silly. But the bin collations are older. And maybe they thought this would be faster. I have not been able to find any indication of that. As a matter of fact, you will see later, it's the other way around. Bin 2 seems to be slightly faster. So, yes. Um, the Bin 2 are the normal thing. Are bin, oh, they're, they're legacy, so try to stay away from those if you can. Um, let's now talk about supplementary characters. So, the original version 18, 1900 collations in up to 2008. They only support the Unicode base plane from 0 to 65.35. They don't understand the characters beyond that plane. Um, the SC collations also support the so-called supplementary characters, which are the characters beyond the base plane. And the way it works is this in UTF-16 is they are encoded in so-called surrogate, surrogate pairs. So the high word will always be in the range from U plus D800 to U plus DBFF, and the low word is always in the range from U plus DC OO to U plus DFFF. And then Unicode is smart enough not to define any characters on these code points. So Unicode is designed for UTF-16. In this server, well, all the version 1900 collations have an SC uh, variant, but there is no for version 80. Uh, if you look at the 140 collation, you will not find the SC moniker in the name because they are all race surrogate compatible which is another way to, to read SC, except for the, well, all binary collations are not surrogate aware. They think this, these bytes are just like any other byte. It's just one character. So let's have a look at these. So here I'm going to move to my database, let one general, let one general 100 CS AS not surrogate aware. And I got a variable here called at Gothic, which uses, which includes the first five letters in the ancient Gothic script. You may know that the Gothic language is no longer alive. And there's also, spice it up, uh, an emoticon or an emoji. Then I'm going to look at the word, the length of characters, the length of bytes, and I'm going to ex extract a substring on the first three characters. And let's do this. And you see, I've got back the word, but SQL Server says 12 characters, 24 bytes. That's all right. That fits with, with what I said before. Each of these characters takes up four bytes. And the first three, well, the first character is that, well, kind of A they had in the alphabet, but the second one is this one, the rhombus with a question mark. Every time when you see that character, that means encoding error. The most common case you will see this is if you have a file that is supposed or labeled to be UTF-8, but turns out actually to be, let's say, Latin 1. You will get lots of these. But in this case, it was broken UTF-16, because SSMS understands UTF-16 fully and realize that the SQL Server has said, well, kind of garbage. Now, I'm going to create a database called check 100 CSASSC. And why you wonder why, if you wonder why it's check, is because, well, check is shorter to type than Latin one general. I'm going to do the same thing again. And now, SQL Server says six characters and substring returns the first three characters in this string. Now, I'm going to declare a table variable with the nvarcar10 variable. So in Varka 10 column, and I'm going to try to put in this value in this column. Let's see how this works. No, that did not work out. String of binary data will be truncated in table, color word, truncated value, and only the first five characters. So wait, well, in Varka 10 doesn't mean 10 characters, it, mean, it means 10 byte pairs. And yes, this is what the Gothic people have had to put up with since SQL 2012. Or, or, well, they would have had to put up with it if they still had been in existence. So you might wonder, when do we actually need these supplementary characters? Yes, most of these are quite a bit exotic. I looked in Wikipedia to find some examples, and I find there's a whole slew of ancient scripts that may not be in your, well, run of your mill system. Uh, there's a full plane, 65,535 code points, with extra geographic characters, which you might need if you work with Chinese or Japanese. Um, there's also various symbols, I, just took out a few here. Playing cards, you actually saw an example of that earlier on. A transportation and map symbols, there's one section, and include a one here. Musical symbols, I wanted to include an example here, but PowerPoint did not support it. But all of these are quite rare, but then we have these guys that also we had in the demo, the emojis or the emoticons. And if you have free text columns in your database, I bet you're gonna have one of these sooner or later because they are becoming more and more popular. I'm not a big fan of them myself, but yes. Of course, you can still store them if you have a plain version 80 collation, no problem. 
The students that are conservative will not understand them. So if you try to find them or try to extract with a substring, you could get into, well, weird effects if you don't have a surrogate wear collation. Now let's move on to the UTF-8 collations. So they were introduced in ESCO 2019, and you can recognize them by the fact that the suffix is UTF-8. All SE collations have also UTF-8 version, so there are no version 8 collations for UTF-8. Um, in the UTF-8 collation, the code bridge for Varkar is always 65001 UTF-8. So this means that there are no longer any restriction for Indic General, etc. Hooray! And UTF-8 collations do not support, you should know this, they do not support the, the legacy text and n-text data types. As a matter of fact, that is true for all SC collations, not only the UTF-8 collations. And there's one single binary UTF-8 collation, letter one general, 100 bin 2 UTF-8. Hmm. Maybe they should have a Turkish binary collation as well. I don't know. Anyway, one reason UTF-8 is popular is because it claims that you can save space compared to with UTF-16. Let's have a look at that. So, for the range from 0 to 127, UTF-8 takes up one byte. That's ASCII. So that's great. If you have an ASCII file, it's also UTF-8 file. And this means that for English, for example, you save up to 50% space compared to UTF-16. The next range is then from 128 to 2047. That is encoded for two, with two bytes. So that's, well, first of all, quite a few uh, Latin characters. So this means that for Swedish and Polish, well, we may not say 50%, but maybe 40 to 45%. And for Cyrillic, Greek, and Arabic, and a couple more, well, they might still use digits, punctuation characters, and, well, maybe an occasional Latin word thrown in. So maybe they say 5 to 10% space. At least they are not... They don't, it's not bad for them. But then we have the range from 2048 to 65535. They need three bytes for every character. That's the language of India. That's Chinese. That's Japanese. That's Thai. A few languages. Up to 50% more space. I'm a little bit in doubt over the popularity of UTF-8 over there, but I might be wrong. And then finally we have beyond the baseline, you need four bytes for every character, but that is the same as UTF-16, so that, that is not really any difference. Now, let's have a look at this. So, I'm going to first create a database called Finnish Swedish 100 CSASSC. So it's sorry going to wear, but it is not... It is not um, supporting UTF-8. And then we're going to look at the same comparison again, looking at string literals in Envarkar and Varkar but slightly a different format of the query, because if I would do this as five columns, the last column would be behind my picture there up in the right corner. So that's they would come as row instead, but we have Alex Mogos, Swanse, Nakamaguru, and also Paris and Fulwith, and that Gothic string. And let's run these. Here we have them correctly. It's Envaka, here we have Varka. So Rax Mogos, it's okay, because that's the right code page. We have Swanse, because we don't have those characters in, characters in the code page. Question marks. Again, fallbacks. Uh, this one is not particularly visible, but this is full width and this is half width. And again, the Gothic string becomes, I think, 12 question marks. Hmm, I think it should be six, but it's 12. Now, anyway, let's create a UTF-8 database. And to celebrate, I'm going to make that a Bengali data. So it's Bengali 100 CS ASSC UTF-8. And I'm going to do select again on that bar card. And look, all strings come back. Unscathed, no, nothing being replaced. Unicode, no matter whether I have car or Edvaka. Great. So let's have a look, a little more look at this. I'm going to create a table called so words and add these words to this table and also the word English. And again, look at the word, the word, the length in char characters, the length in bytes, and also a substring of them. So first year, I need some water, sorry about that. So, sorry. So, um, English, seven characters, seven bytes, and eng, the first three characters. Rex Mogus, ten characters, 30 bytes, because there are three letters not in ASCII, and the first, first one are 27 bytes. But we get back the first three characters all right. Rex. Swanson, again, six characters, and eight bytes, two characters in the range from 127 to 2048. Get Swan. Okay, great. Nakam Guru, three characters, and now nine bytes. You might recall that it was six bytes only when we had Varkar with the Japanese code page. But now it's a nine bytes. And here is Paris and Fullwidth, five characters and 15 bytes, because these Fullwidth characters are, well, somewhere over there among the East Asian characters, so to speak. 
And the Gothic string is six characters and 24 bytes, just like it was with UTF-16. <clears throat> now, I'm going to create this table called Varka 6. It has a column called Sun, which is Varka 6. And I'm going to try to add the word Swanson, six characters into that table. Well, if you have been paying attention, you know as this is how this is going to end. Yes, in tears. So string of bar data will be truncated in table, column sum truncated value at swan. Because yes, that is six bytes and six characters. And if you well, you all didn't know why, but well, Swedish, Polish, French people, or even English people have never seen this before. And they run into this. What? They freak out completely. What? What is Microsoft thinking? What? This must be a bug, a bad sign. What have they been smoking? Yeah, you might question that, but as I said, the Japanese people have had to put up with this since SQ2000. That is just the way it is. I know the ANSI standard also permits Varka 6 to mean six characters, and maybe Microsoft's going to change that in the future, but I'm not really holding my breath because I think it could have some architectural impacts. But I might be wrong on that point. So anyway, to repeat, um, Varka 30 means 30 bytes, and, well, if to permit for 30 characters, you may need Varka 60, and still take your chances that you will not need to store Chinese or emojis in your data. To be really sure, you would have need to have 120, but maybe you have 30 characters in the limit because you have other constraints like, well, column widths and reports, etc. But anyway, keep this in mind, a 10 baud value in the Varka 60 does not take up more space than it does in the Varka 30. So it may or may not be a problem. Now, let's say this. We're going to design an application with international, for international use, and you should always do that. I will return to that. Now, should we use UTF-8 or UTF-16 that is NVACAR? Well, my take on it is that for a new application, I would still go with NVACAR. Why? Well, first of <coughs> all, it's more predictable. Because particularly if I have short columns where the width, width actually matters, most likely I don't have to account for emojis or Chinese if I am in the... Well, Chinese doesn't really matter, but MODS could be my problem, the surrogate characters. So 30 by NVACAR 30 would probably mean 30 characters. For a free text column, yeah, but 200 is if that happens to be only 198, and maybe I can live with it. Performance, yes, I get somewhat better performance with NVACAR. I will return to this later on. And also, if you think about space, well, you can save space with UTF-16 as well. Use row compression. I did the test. I have a demo database that I use in other presentations. So I created that same schema, both the UTF-16 and UTF-8, and there is, well, mainly English data, but there's also some non-English data in that, although mainly in Latin characters, well, some Cyrillic as well. And applied row compression on both databases, exactly the same size, exactly the same size. But this is absolute, absolutely a matter of preference, and if you go for UTF-8, I will not come after you. Now let's say you have an existing application that uses Varkar with a legacy code page, and now you find, wait a minute, we need to support, because let's say we have bought an office in Romania, a company in Romania, and we need to support Romanian data. We are based in, let's say, well, Spain, with a different code page. So switching to NVARCAR, well, first of all, I had to change all the tables, but there's a lot of code to go through, all variable declarations, temp tables, etc. Well, oh, that doesn't sound fun. Now, UTF-8, well, you still have to alter all tables to fix the collation, but if you can keep the column lengths, column lengths, well, you have a free ride. If you need to extend the column lengths, yeah, still a bit of work to do, but may, maybe still less than NVACAR. So that is the, maybe the big case for UTF-8 migration. Now, by the way, uh, this doesn't really have to deal with UTF-8, but this is one of my uh, strong opinions. So, if you're starting developing a new application today, please don't get the idea of for columns that is going to hold names, free text, and things like that. Don't even get the idea of using Varkar with a legacy code page. But such columns should, in a modern database, always be Unicode, be that nvarkar or Varkar with UTF-8. That's my very strong opinion on the matter. And please don't tell me, oh, we will never be international. Look, this is the third decade of the 21st century. We live in a global and rapidly changing world. Yeah, you might think so. You will never be international. And then tomorrow your boss or your boss's 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 boss tell you, oh, we have been acquired by this company in Romania and we're gonna we're gonna use our database, but we're gonna have to support Romania and date. Yeah. If you didn't do the right from the beginning, change into Unicode after the fact is expensive, painful, not fun. Do it right from the beginning. 
I like to point out that columns are going to hold codes, currency codes, state codes, all sorts of codes. S status columns where you make well, any for, uh, for new, over OK, etc., whatever. Also, transaction ID like barcodes. Many of these are often ASCII only. For these, you don't need Unicode. You can go with a legacy code, but here it's OK. Now, let's move over to the SQL collations. These are legacy collations from the days of SQL 7 and earlier. Up to SQL 7, you see, you could, in, a in an instance of SQL Server or a server, because you could only have one instance on one machine of SQL Server. Multi instance came also with SQL 2000. Anyway, you could only have one collation of sort order, as it was called in those days, for the entire server, all databases, all column. And even earlier at 6.5, there was only Varka. There was not any NVARCAR, no support for Unicode. So with this SQL collation, well, for NVARCAR, it's quite much like a version 80 Windows collation with the same Unicode support, etc., when it comes to code points and the same kind of rules. For Varkar, it's a completely different ballgame. They it's based tied to specific code points. That's nothing, to, that's it's why like the Windows collation, but with its own library and rules. Now I said these are le legacy collations, so why spend time with them? Well, this collection, SQL Latin 1 General C1 CIAS, is might be legacy, but is probably by far the most commonly used collation in this world. Why? Because it, it, it is the default in so many situations. First of all, if you install SQL Server with a system of a Caleb English, United States, you will default, SQL Server will default to this collection. For any other system of Kale, it will default to Windows collection. But for this, Collation for some reason, I think I'll skip a jokes about why, it defaults to this collation. And you know, in that country over there, I think they have maybe one or two, maybe five, maybe 50,000 servers, and there might be some servers out of that country that also have that one by default, etc. So that's a quite common way that that happened. On Linux and Docker, where there is not really a setup wizard, that might also be the default, unless you specify that on the command line. And for anything you do in Azure, anything you do with the portal, you're going to say elect the collation. The drop-down will always have this collation as, your, as, a, as a default choice. Well, with the exception of Azure SQL VMs, because in that case, you don't even get the choice in the portal. You will have to change the collection once the VM has been created. Yes. Now, let's have a look at these collections, and particularly this guy here, the common one. So, we're going to move to this uh, collation, SQL Latin 1 General, C1, CIS. Yes, create that database with that collation, and we're going to look at the word or name Kosice, the big, second biggest city of Slovakia. I'm going to compare it here as so a leading up, uh, just normal spelling, to an all uppercase, again to all uppercase almost, but not this one. And then to all uppercase again, but now with answer it's Unicode. And the result is a bit surprising. It's not equal. So this character here is still case sensitive, although this is a case insensitive collation. Now, not all escalation, SQL collations behave this way. So here's another one, SQL Swedish Standard Pref C1 CIAS. And I'm going to use this one and run the same thing in. And here, nothing strange, Kosice in this way is equal to all uppercase. So nothing strange here. Now we're going to look at how sorting characters. This is interesting, interesting from more than one perspective. So um, I got this table, I got the number, I got the CH column and NCH column. The CH column is car one and the NCH column is N car one. So that's Unicode and this is, well, code page 1252 and in the next goal And then I'm going to add some characters to this one. And I'm going to run this first sort by the NCH column. So this is according to Unicode and, well, basically like a Windows collection. And you can see I get these or this order. And these, particularly these two, come between A and Z. Although the order here might, it's case insensitive, so they are actually the same. But anyway, I'm going to do this also for the latter one, general CIS. And you can see it is the same. My belief is that for these two collations, and this might be the second most used collation in this world, uh, these, these two collations are actually identical, although I haven't proven it fully. Now let's change these to the CH column, still sticking to the Windows collection. I, I, and I still get the same result. Recall what I said for UTF, there is no library for Varkar, so anything is being converted to UTF-16, so it's nothing strange that you get the same result with Varkar or Car and NCAR. Now, 
let's do this for the SQL collection. And now, 1, 4, 2, 3, 8, 9, 6, 7, 10. So first of all, the plus jumps up to come before the minus. That's nothing really strange with that, because how to sort punctuation characters is just a, sort of arbitrary. But this is kind of funny. The S hatchet, these two letters now sort before the digit. Now that's kind of weird. But, and let's also look at this with the SQL, the other SQL collection. This one still sorts the plus before the minus, but these two are now considered letters. So I don't know the full story, but my assumption and guess is that I know so far that this, these two letters, and also set handshake and the OED graph, which are the other two that behave this way, they are in that range from 128 to 159 when Microsoft added extras. So I'm thinking that when this correlational sort order was defined, SQL Latin, Latin one general, um, they either these, they have not put any characters at all at these code points, or they were different characters that were punctuation. Then they changed that code page, but they couldn't change the sort order because there are indexes defined from the sort order. Once you have a correlation or a sort order, it's cast in stone, you can't change it because of indexes. Anyway, this has nothing to do with SQL collections, but it's sort of left over from the version numbers. So now I'm going to sort these by Latin 1 General 100 CIS, and as I told you before, it doesn't matter which, which if we have the CH column or NCH column. Now here's the difference, one, two, three, five, four. So in a version 100 collation, the zero or the plus character has changed places. I don't know how many of these there are. I think I found this one by chance, but just as an illustration of the version number may matter. Now, also one left over, kind of, we have the case sorting table in this database, that one general 100 CSAS. We looked at case sorting case sensitive data. Let's now look at this collation, SQL that one general, CP1 CSAS. So how this happens in with the SQL collection. And you see, first of all, plus minus, they change places, nothing strange. And there was certain Australia. So again, case only carries a secondary weight. But then we can see this mixed case. Now the uppercase all, all comes first, and the up, lowercase all comes last. And also here the mixed minus case, the, here the hyphen does not carry a secondary weight. So again, as girl collections does it differently, and whether to sort uppercase first or last, that is just a choice you made. Having uppercase, lowercase first, I think is a kind, kind of unicode convention. So, um, just to repeat, well, I, actually, I'm going to skip this and move on because this is just a summary of what I've talked about on, the, on, those, on that uh, page. So, now let's talk about some pain points with collations. Collations and metadata. Yeah, this is, this is, I think, I like the least, more or less. Due to legacy, collations also control metadata. Remember that I talked about way back in SQL 7. In SQL 7, yes. There was only one sort order in, in the entire instance. So also the system tables has to use that, use that sort order. And the system tables hold well, the names of tables, to procedures, etc. So they were also affected by the sort order. So depending on which sort order, case insensitive, case sensitive, well, that affect the metadata. The way it works today is that, well, the server collection that controls well, the names of server level objects, databases, logins, etc. And also the names of temp tables and column names in temp tables and table variables, since they live in temp to be. The, and also the names of variables, where, whereas the values of the variables follow the database collection. Now the database collection controls the names of database level objects, tables, columns, users, etc. With one exception, and that is server objects, not queues, but services, contracts, etc. They have a binary collation because since they are inter must need to be interoperable over many servers and, and databases. But that they, they're kind of a special case. So let's have a look at this. And I need some more water. So I have my database here, Latin 1 General 100 CIAS. I'm going to create a table called My Table in Mixed Case and two column A and B in all lowercase. And then I run a select list. Well, this runs fine. And I try to create a table called my table in all uppercase. Nope, we already have that guy. Um, so then, what is my server collection? As a, as a reminder, it's Finnish Swedish 100 CSAS. Any instance I install for my own use will always be case sensitive. No discussion. So then I try to declare a variable at A and try to at lowercase A and try to refer it as uppercase A. No, 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 we don't have that one because that's my server collection, which is case sensitive. 
But now to confuse matters, so here I've got two variables, at lowercase a and at uppercase a. This one has a lowercase a, this one has uppercase a. And when I compare the two variables, they are equal. Whew, I think the head starts to spin a little bit here. Anyway, let's now we'll move over to our Latin 1 General 100 CSAS database. Again, I'm going to create that my table with the same column names. But now when I run this select, I'm told, no, no, we don't have that table. OK, I fixed the name, the name of the table, but still keep the column names uh, uppercase. No, no, we don't have those columns. But if I try to create a new no, table, my table in all uppercase, no problem. So in this case, well, all uppercase, well, if you've been working with Pascal, basic, I mean, this baby with case insensitive, nothing strange. And here, down here, well, if you've been working with, working with what? Python, Perl, C sharp, C++, pff, nothing strange with this. What is strange is the fact that it depends on a setting. It's not consistent. Now, let's move to this database, Turkish CIAS, and create this table instruments with a leading uppercase. And then trying to refer to it, well, we didn't care to press the, the shift key this time. No, no, we don't have that table. Instruments with a lowercase i. Are you joking? Because, remember, in Turkish, these two are separate letters, the dotless i and the dotted i. And now let's create a database called Finnish Reader CI. Move that one. And going to create a table called one V and one double V. Yes, double V, not W. We are in the Finnish Reader database, so it's double V. I know that. I know this language. Because, no, no, there is already an object named double V in the database. Because it's just an accent. I have seen forum posts where people with non-Swedish name have run into things like this, and they were mildly, very widely confused, and I kind of have an understanding for them. But yes, I had fun with it, really good. I can tell you I smile. Anyway, so here are some tips. If you're writing international software, so you like working for an ISV, so develop with a case-sensitive creation, both on server level and database level. Or just forget about the Turkish market, because if you go case insensitive and then try to sort out the mess with all these eyes, <laughs> no, no, no. Also, corollary on this, use only lowercase for identifiers. I've actually worked for many years developing an SQL Server with case sensitive correlation for a slightly different reason, not being Turkish, but because we couldn't be sure of what our customer uses. So we said case sensitive and only lowercase. And also, avoid very short names, because the longer your, name, your names are, the less is that you will run into these access insensitive surprises with, name, with names colliding. That's just some tips. Now, wouldn't it be great if that could be a fixed metadata collection so we didn't have to bother? Actually, you can do this in SQL Server. You can create a so-called contained database. And if you do, the metadata collection will always be this one, Latin 1 General 100 CIAS KSWS SC. Unfortunately, though, our contained databases were introduced in SQL 2012, and since then, as partial contained, and since then, nothing has happened. And also, there's quite a few restrictions. Not all features can be used with contained databases, so I can't really recommend them. But still, I think they should at least try to make this as a general option. And for this reason, I have a feedback item here. So please go here and vote. And I will try to drop this link in the chat while the presentation is running. I would really appreciate your votes here. Now, another collation pain point with the leads for better reasons. So in an expression, if you have two columns with different collations, well, you will get a conflict. And well, I think I better do a demo to explain what it, what, how it works. So. Again, Latin 1 General uh, CIAS, I've got to create a table called Places this time, and I'm going to add some places. New York, London, Paris, Munich, and Buenos Aires. And then I want to run this, and also going to have a temp table with only London and Paris, Paris in all uppercase. And now I'm going to run this query. I want to find the places in my main table that are in the temp table. Now, you might recall that my server collation, and those are the collation for temp to be, is not Latin 1 General CIAS. So, SQL Server now has two columns with different collations. So, the rules of which, uh, so, which, the rules of which collations should it apply? Should it roll the dice? Should it say that, oh, well, this one comes before this one, and uh, this one, take this one to the left, or this one is a temp, well, SQL Server actually does the right thing. It says, I don't know, cannot resolve the collation conflict between Latin and General CIS 
and Finnish Swedish 100 CS in the equal to operation. So anytime in an expression, it doesn't have to be equal, equal, it could be even concatenation where it may not really matter, <clears throat> you will get this error if you mix collations. So you will have to tell which collation to use. <clears throat> Sorry, I need some water again. Um, so, and the way to sort this out is that you have to coerce the equation or force the equation on one of the sides. So typically, in this kind of query, you would say that the column of the temp table should have the same collation as the main table. So I put in collate lag one journal CIS. And now the query runs. Now you might say, but I don't want to hard code that collation because next time this might be running in the Czech Republic and I have a Czech collation, etc. Well, there is a trick for that. You can say collate database default. And that means the, the default collation for the current database. And now that also works. I get back the data. According to a case insensitive collation. Remember that Paris is an in, in up, all uppercase in the temp table. Now, what do you think about this one? Here I'm saying place collate French CSAS. So again, I got two different collations. Here is my system collation, my Finnish Swedish, and here I got the French collation. So will I get an error now? No, I don't, but I only get back London, not Paris. Because when you cast the collation on one column in an expression, you are actually casting the co collation for all columns in the expression. So this one also assumes this French collation and case sensitive. Now, what about variables? Well, literals. Well, I'm only going to do this with, with variables. So here I got at place, and the value is Paris in all lowercase. I'm going to try this both with this table and the temp table. Will I get an error? No, the first one returns Paris, the second does not. When you have this uh, column and the variable, the variable will always assume the collation of the column. The column will always win. Same goes for a string literal. Now, before we leave this, <clears throat> I'd like to show you what is the kind of right way to deal with temp tables. So rather than having in each query put in the collate clause, put that in the temp table definition and say place varcar collate database default, which again means the default of the current database. So I can redo that and now I can run this query. And it's kind of best practice to use this always, even if your server database collation is the same, because maybe, at least in, if you're, you know that in your organization, if you have servers with different collation, you don't get into problems if you move the database to different instances. So it might even be better from the start to have different server and database collations, because then you will not forget to do this, maybe. Anyway, so to summarize, the way to resolve these collation conflicts is to force the collation on one side, to the collation that you want, and this casts the collations for both columns. One thing I did not tell you, but it's very important, you should know that if you cast the collation on the column, that kills any index of the column, because the index is organized according to the original collation, not the one you cast it. So the index is now useless. It doesn't work anymore. Best practice for your temp tables, use collate database default in your temp tables definition. And finally, yes, columns always win over variables and constants. Now it's time to look at how to change the database collation, which is not fun and it's hard. And how hard it is, well, depends on how wild change you make. Well, it may seem simple at first because if you look in the, the documentation, you can see I can do all the database collate and specify my collation. But that only changes the collations of the system tables. Furthermore, if there is a single check constraint in your database, in my databases, there are always check constraints. It gives up and raises the white flag. I don't know how to do this. And it does not have to be a check constraint on a string column, because it's the column name itself it's worried about. So you have to drop all the check constraints and reapply them. <clears throat> and then for your user tables, well, you need to run all the table, all the column, for all of them, all the string columns. And then you need to repeat the full column definition, because there's no way to say, I only want to change the collation, keep the rest. No, you have to repeat everything. And indexes must be dropped and restored. Foreign keys and check constraints must be dropped and restored. And that could take a whole lot of time, take a whole lot of law, because those tables might be big. And when you reapply them, they may fail. Let's say you go from case insensitive to case sensitive, well, then the foreign key can explode. And if you go the other way around from case sensitive to case insensitive, your indexes may no longer be unique. So here are some tips. First of all, take as many shortcuts as you can because it's not always as bad as I suggested here. You may not have any indexes on your string columns, or you maybe you might be changing from, let's say, Lat1 general to SQL Lat1 general, or the other way around. That's 
not very many differences, it's going to work out fairly smoothly. Sometimes it might be better to create a new database and copy data over, and maybe then in the copy statements, because you might need to do data cleanse, cleansing to, to deal with these errors. Um, I'd like to give you a hint for a script, my friend, and in the PCOL, Ugo Cornelis from the Netherlands, he had to do this task for a client a couple of years back. He found a script on the internet, which he refined for his needs, then he dumped this on a blog post. Through the years, people have been enhancing this script for things they run into. I think I had one small thing for that script. Eventually, Baz Robes took the script to his GitHub site, but then I think someone added a little more enhancement to the blog post. Uh, anyway, wherever you look, be prepared that you might have to refine further because you might run into things none of else before you ran into. Uh, if you Google around, you may also find blog posts that suggest that you can use this option, setup option for SQL Server, minus Q. Warning, stay away, it's undocumented and unsupported. I believe this option exists to change the collations of the system databases when you install a SQL Server and they know what they're doing. But it works in all databases. But yes, that can be have a bad things. Things can fail. Things can fail silently. So you might be working with an incorrect database. So stay away, please. Now, some tricks you can do with the collations. You might not, well, removing accents, finding words that start with uppercase, removing invisible characters. Maybe not apparent what this has to do with collations, but we'll see. So I've got a table here called more words, and then we're going to add well more words to it. We have already seen some words today, but we can have we can still have more words. There are more words in this world. So I added some words here, and that's both a word and an original column for reasons that will prevail. Anyway, we can look here at the words. There's some Danish, some Swedish, Polish, well, French. Uh, Japanese, German, etc. Anyway, you may notice that all of these words, all of these words has letter beyond the ASCII character set. And then sometimes people say, oh, how do we remove special characters? And I ask, what special characters? Because don't please, please don't tell me that this, this, the letter of my alphabet is a special character. It's not very special to me, I can tell you. Anyway, I digress, sorry about that. But let's say, okay, we only want ASCII characters. So how do we do that? Well, here's a trick you can do with collations. So you cast a word, sorry, to a collation, which is based on a different, which is not based on the Latin script. For Greek, for example, which has its own alphabet. So in the range from 128 to 255, there are no Latin letters at all. And then you cast to Varkar, and there you will see a bunch of fallback characters. So boom, all ASCII. And all the ones are replaced by localized except for this guy. Maybe we wanted to see an AE here, but we got the question mark. Quite efficient. It doesn't always work because maybe there are also punctuation characters and other things that are beyond the ASCII range that you don't want. In that case, well, other bunch of nested replaced from ASCII 2017 and on, there is the translate function, which makes this slightly easier, or quite a bit easier. Now, once we have this table, let's try to find words that start in all uppercase. And many people, they try to do like A to Z percent, because they've done that in Unix, they've done that in text editors. But they get back all words, because yes, this is subject to collation. So this includes the lowercase characters. Okay, people think, let's do this case sensitive. That didn't help much. Well, we got rid of the one that started with a lowercase a, because now we actually have a range which says uppercase a, lowercase b, uppercase b, lowercase c, etc. That is what the range a to z mean in this collation. So how to solve this then? Well, a, a binary collation, of course, so we get by code point. Boom! Only the ones that start in uppercase. And finally, here's another trick we can problem we can run into. Sometimes you might get data from some funny source that puts in well, control characters. So here I bought just setting up ABC, car zero, the null byte, and XYZ. First of all, here's the funny thing when I do this, I only see ABC. No, this is not SQL Server pulling your legs. You can see that SQL Server understands its seven characters. No, the one pulling your legs here is Management Studio. You see, Management Studio is written in C Sharp, and you know, all the C drive languages has the idea about the null byte being the string terminator. Although I think Azure Data Studio is also written in some C languages, but it actually shows this correctly. But Management Studio will terminate a character on the null byte. Now, okay, you know about that, so you think I'm going to do a replace of this car zero and get rid of it? 
but it didn't change anything. Why? Well, you might remember this about undefined characters. This is an undefined code point. So replace this. I don't know what to do with this. Well, I, I gave up and do nothing. Well, how to fix this? Cast to a binary equation. I cast, well, it doesn't matter which one I cast here, but I cast the variable. And ABZ, XYZ, six characters. And this is just a repeat of what I've been talking about. So we're going to move on and talk about how collations can affect performance. And I'm going to start with a demo for two cases where collations has an enormous effect on performance. So now this time I'm going to be in temp DB. And I'm going to create this table called Gwids. And why the table is called Gwids, you will learn in a second. So it has first an identity column, and then there are four string columns, all with a unique index. The first one is called Windows NVARCAR, and it indeed it is NVARCAR, with a collation of Latin One General CIAS. The next one is called SQL NVARCAR, it's also NVARCAR 200, with a collation of SQL Latin One General C1 CIAS. And then we have Windows NVARCAR and SQL VARCAR, which are, yes, VARCAR with the same pair of collations. So I'm going to fill up this table, yes, with grids, four grids on every row, and separated by a space. 100,000 rows, so that will be around 147 characters, I think, on every row. Then I'm going to run a query here. I'm going to find it. It's not really a point lookup, but it's akin to a point lookup. I'm going to find all the ones that start with ABC5, uh, five, ABC5. So it will hit quite a few rows, not very many. And I'm going to do like with it. That, that's an NVAR cast string here. It's N in front. And because this is a very quick operation, in order to understand how fast it runs, I'm going to run it for 500 milliseconds and see how many iterations I can run. And this, this part of this is a little trick of this. Sometimes the demo goes, oh, 20,000, it was fast today. Okay, let's see how the SQL collision fares. If that is, that is in a difference. Yes, it was. And uh, that actually shouldn't be the difference. That's a little problematic. Let's see, I'm going to try this one again. Maybe it's because that was unusually fast. Um, yeah, this one is a little difficult. Huh. Okay, let's try this one again. Sorry. They should run about the same time. They should certainly not be a factor of two here. Hmm. Interesting, 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 interesting. Okay. Um, normally, they do run with the same pace. Now, let's try this one here with the SQL var column. Let's see. I'm going to run this first before I talk about it, I think. Uh, let's see what happens. Oh. At least it's slower than the SQL collation. And it should be at least about the half of the speed of the NVAR collation if the demo goes as expected. Because here we have a var car column and we have, it, have an NVAR car value. This means, as you may know, that the var car value, the var car column, will be converted to NVAR car. And first you may think, that's a performance disaster, that is not going to work out by it. The index can't be used. But because it's a Windows collation, and I mean, if this had been the NVAR car value, there would still have been a conversion internally to UTF-16, because that's always the case with VAR car. So the index can still be used, but there is some extra operators to the plan, so that's why you have an overhead of a factor of two, well, two, maybe five. Now let's look at the SQL collation, and this time I'm quite confident that the demo will work out as intended, because this is a completely different game. 20. That's something completely different, a lot slower. Why? Well, you saw that in the demo. For VARCAR, the rules for, for, or for SQL collections, the rules for NVARCAR and VARCAR are completely different. So there's no way we can seek this index. The index is just dead. There must be a scan, and that's why it's so slow. And here I said it's an overhead of two, well, factor two to five. That may sound bad, but hey, these operations are quick. You may not even notice, but here, yeah, well, it all depends on the size of the table. So it could be 1,000, a factor of 100,000, 1 million, or 1 billion. Just, there's no end to it. Now, you may say, but hey, this is stupid. You shouldn't program like this. That's true. This is, this is a program mistake. But it can happen a little bit too easy. Because someone, oh, we don't use, we don't need NVARCAR. We're going to go for VARCAR. You think when you design the database. But then the developers think, oh, we're going to use this ORM, which defaults to NVARCAR. Usually ORMs have settings, you can control that. But, so that's one risk you have with SQL creations. You can get these really big performance disasters. Or someone just puts in the wrong data type by mistake or by habit. Anyway, we're going to do another operation. We're going to do a, um, a 
alike with, a le with both a leading and a trailing per set. So in this case, there's no chance to seek the index. There must be a scan. And this time it's a Varkar string. And we're going to do this for all the four collations. We have all the four columns. Not four collations, but four columns. And this is kind of the revenge for the SQL collection. You see here, it's a lot faster than the other two. Let's say a factor of seven. If you wonder why the count varies, remember that they are different widths and the different, so the, that's why you get a slight kind of variation. Why? Well, we don't only have, to, in this case, have to scan the index. We also have to scan, or SQL Server has to scan, the entire string. To find ABC, well, the first character, is it A? No. The second character, is it A? Yes. Is the next character B? No, it's not. And go on. Down to all. It doesn't have to look at the last two characters. Now, with the Unicode, there are very complex tables to get through because there are very many things you have to consider when it comes to Unicode, things I haven't even shown you in this presentation. With an SQL collection, for Varkar, it only has to consider that specific code page with a lot, lot less characters. Over 255, there are no Japanese SQL collections. So it's a lot simpler rules, and that's why it's faster. So OK, for these like operations, maybe we, we should use an SQL collection with Varkar. Now there is a trick. We can do this with NVARCAR as well. And Unicode, what do you think about using a binary collection? Look, it's even faster than SQL collection. But there is kind of a glitch, sorry. Well, problem. The count is wrong, it's zero. Hey, I got a fix for that. I'm going to apply upper both on the column and the search tree. Ro it's kind of rolling my own case insensitive. Look, still faster than SQL equation and the right count. So this is a kind of a neat trick. It does not give exactly the same rule as a case insensitive collation would give you, but you might get away with it. So if you have a like operation somewhere in the system and the users think it's too slow, and for some reason you don't want to go, go full text, which, which is of course the real solution to make this go fast, but then you can do this. Now, if the user says we also want accident insensitive, uh, yeah, maybe not, maybe not. Well, so this just summarizes what I talked about. If you make a lookup on a bar and call value on the index column, yes, that's a program mistake, but with a Windows collection, not too bad. With, with an SQL collection, you get the scan really bad. Performance we like for and here SQL collations are a lot faster than for a Windows collection because they have simpler rules. But you can use this trick with binary collation and do rolling your own case insensitive, but rolling your own accident insensitive. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I want to do that. Anyway, more about collations and performance for other things. Well, I'm a kind of crazy guy, so I ran a test of all 5,500 collations. Kept my laptop busy for nine days, testing five different operations, both for Varkar and Envaka. And I did this in SQL 2019. As a matter of fact, I ran the same thing in 2008, but please don't tell anyone. They might lock me in. Anyway, oh, so I'm going to show you some of that data. And I'd like to point out, first of all, the effect of the real-world workload is likely, likely to be far less than what the numbers indicate. So take this, be very careful, don't rush away, and still you will see that the effect is not that extreme. First of all, you may think that case-sensitive should be faster than case-insensitive. I thought so too, but turns out it is the other way around, if only with a narrow margin. Now, the version 100 collations, I found that, well, depending on the operation, they, they could be up to 30% slower than the version 80 collations. And I would assume this is because the, the character tables are even larger, because more code points are defined. This is kind of interesting. For a Windows collection, Varkar, and not talk about UTF-8, I will come back to those later, but for the late, with legacy collections, well, Varkar is up to 50% slower than NVARCAR, depending on the operation, because of that conversion to UTF-16 and back. For the SQL collection, it's the other way around because, well, there's no conversion for them back, and the rules of Varkar are simpler, but it's only like, with only with the like operator, you get this extreme, extreme, uh, extreme difference. Well, pattern index as well, of course, but for other things, it's, well, I think the sorting operation was like 40% faster, again, comparing it for SQL collection. And you might wonder, are some languages slower than others? Yes. Are some languages faster than others? Not really, the top was quite even, but I could see two languages kind of trailing behind the rest. The rest, and that was, although it was, that was kind of a scale, but the, those that stood out was Hungarian and Vietnamese. But, well, 
if you're going to work with Hungarian data, if you're, if you're in Hungary, are you going to use the Romanian collation just because it's faster? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, now, speaking about UTF-8, so I found it interesting. So I made a special study of uh, UTF-8 with the Valkar column. Compare that to using NVALKAR in the version 8 collation, assuming that I'm in a place where I can use the version 8 collation. I don't have to think about extra characters, undefined corporates, etc. Well, look at these numbers. So for the like operation, well, it's not that big. The point look up, 22%. Group by where force has matched, 27%. Loop join, almost 50%. And for the sorting operation that I had, more than twice the speed. And I covered already two of these things on the previous slide, because this includes the conversion from UTF-8 to UTF-16, and the fact that it's version 80 towards, actually was a version 100 collection. So the bigger character tables. But it doesn't account for everything. So I think UTF-8 also seemed to add some extra help. Uh, also, binary collations, that might, this might be interesting to know. So comparing binary collations towards normal collations so for these operations, there is a range here because so 15 here means compared to a version 80 collation, 25 to version 100 collation. So you can see for sorting, it starts to take off. But get, then again, sorting by a binary collation, hmm. Well, you can have sorting inside the query plan because the optimizer thinks it's smart. And maybe more interesting is I actually had a real-world test case where I, needed, I found it interesting to do this. So I had my database, converted it to a binary collation, and a particular supersedia, very important for our system. I ran it with different inputs, and I found that I, so it was a mix of operations, and I found I could gain between, depending on, on the how much I had to handle, between 10 to 30 percent. It was small. Well, I liked it, but not enough that we'd actually change to binary collation. And then bin versus the bin two collations. Well, <clears throat> I found in my test that bin two is well marginally faster, very small difference. Only for the order by that it was more than 10%. Um, but anyway, bin is not faster. So bin is just well, weird. Lots of caveats here. Take this, this data that I gave you here with a big grain of salt. The first two are very important. They, those are big effects. But these other ones is just kind of trivial. These tests that are in are very synthetic, very specific operations. Maybe I should have written big query that included all operations, but pff, that's too difficult. And also, they don't do not take into account the effect of the size. So yes, the Varkar operation is 50% slower than in Varkar, but maybe the total operation is still faster than Varkar because it takes up less space and we have to scan all the data. And also keep in mind that the system has more operations than just string operations. So it that, that numerics and blocking, all that, that maybe will dwarf the effect of the collations. So if you really want to know, if you're considering, should we go with these collations? Oh, that might affect performance. Or well, run your own tests. So I'd like to give special thanks to Microsoft for supporting the data platform geeks and the SQL Server geeks, the community initiatives. Uh, I'd also like to thank you for listening. I'd like to remind you for that there's three ways you can win prizes. Post your selfie with this hashtag. Visit the sponsors and exhibitors. Uh, in this, this conference, and most of all, give session and conference feedback. And I particularly care about the session feedback. If you like this, please tell this. If you didn't like it, please tell me, so I know that, and the data platform geeks, that they shouldn't have me again, etc., etc. I'd really like to know what you think, and also not only sort of, yes, this was good, but if you have any specific things, please tell me. And also, if you'd like to follow, follow these people on Twitter, you have the Twitter handle here. This is my final slide. My name is Alan Somasco. My email address is sql at somasco, S-E. Any mail you have about this presentation or something else that you wonder about, feel free to drop me a mail. You find slides and scripts on my website, somasco.se slash percent. And finally, if you run this, run the demos yourself, this is a link to cleanup script that will just drop all databases. And although this is being recorded in advance and it will take a month before it's being shown, I'm still looking, already looking forward to have interact with you in the Q&A session. Thank you very much for listening.